All right. Hey, everyone. This is your friend, Kent C. Dodds, and I am with my friend and hopefully your friend, too, Dan Abramoff. Say hi, Dan. Hey there. <laughs> You're so enthusiastic. I love it. <laughs> Hey there. Uh, all right. So, um, Dan, I am super excited to talk with you always, like anytime. I'm, uh, I really enjoy our, our uh, conversations. And um, yeah, today I, I wanted to talk about, well, maybe I, I, it'd be good to give an introduction to you. I kind of take for granted that people will know who you are, uh, but it'd be great if you could give us a little intro to yourself. Um, tell us who you are, what you're about, what you're doing, and um, maybe you could uh, just say one non-tech thing that you're interested in. Okay, uh, right. So my name is Dan Abramov. I work on the React team at Facebook. Uh, React is a UI library, but if you're watching this, you probably already know that. <laughs> um, one non-tech thing that I'm interested in, I don't really... I haven't had any hobbies for a while. I think the only non-tech thing I'm doing lately is just like watching Netflix. I don't know if that, ha if that counts, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I've been there for sure. Uh, sometimes you just get, you're so into it. Like I play Fortnite, but really badly. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Very, very cool. Um, cool. So today, Dan, I wanted to talk with you about hooks. Of course, uh, that's kind of the thing that, um, is on a lot of people's minds, whether they're into React or not. Uh, and we have the the people who are like super interested in in this new hooks thing, um, almost to a fault. Um, and then, uh, and that I, I think maybe I lump myself in that category a little bit. Um, but then we have uh, people who are really skeptical of it and like, oh, I guess you just must hate classes and and you just uh, you want to make things complicated just to make things complicated, whatever. Um, so there's a lot to unpack here with hooks. Um, and and I, I think there are a lot of really good resources for people getting started with hooks. So I don't want to go too too far into that. Like, you know, reactjs.org slash hooks and watch that video and, and you'll get a really good intro uh, to the, the concept of hooks. Um, but yeah, why don't we kind of unpack the idea of, um, or maybe we could start with just a little brief, like why hooks thing, and then we can get into some of the more um, more details there. Right. So do, do we assume that people, people watching this already, uh, already watched like the video introduction or you, you can give us like a, it? like a 20, 30 second little intro to the, like conceptually right. what hooks is. So I think the way I think about hooks is it's really like two parts. Um, so one part is that we, so hooks let you reuse behavior between components more easily in a very flexible way. And another part is that, so in order to do that, we need to give you some primitives that you can, uh, like the building blocks uh, that let you do that. And the second part is that those building blocks turn out to be sufficient to like implement pretty much all React features. So uh, in that sense, hooks also let you write code uh, without, without like declaring a component class, because it turns out that uh, those built-in blocks that you use to build these reusable behaviors, they're also sufficient for just like declaring components. So you can think of hooks as a new component API that is, uh, that is a little bit more flexible. Yeah, cool. I, and I think from my my takeaway or my impression from uh, the messaging that I've seen is uh, the real the biggest motivation um, behind hooks is um, a desire to have a simpler way to share logic between these components, like you said. So like um, before with with classes, we had um, well, with with react.create class, we had mixins and those worked pretty well, but they had some problems and um, also, I think the desire was, um, you know, JavaScript now has classes. Let's not re-implement our own version of classes. So we move over to classes and we lose mixins. And so then we start thinking, well, inheritance isn't the approach we want. So, um, you know, Sebastian came up with this idea, oh, this higher order component, a, a function that makes a component that can be like a configurable component kind of thing. That had some problems. And we move over to render props and uh, React Spring, I think was the, or React Motion was was a big initializer on the render props idea and, and this headless UI kind of uh, concept. 
Uh, and that was really good. Uh, had a couple of little problems. What were like, what was the, for you, what was the big um, drive toward hooks? Um, what were the, uh, the things that the community was kind of missing out on before hooks came around? So I think it's, uh, it's kind of hard to explain because all of those things kind of tie together. So like every mm -hmm. one of those patterns, like I'm not saying that they're like bad, like even mixins are kind of okay-ish, uh, mm -hmm. but eventually you just run into walls with them. So mm -hmm. like with mixins specifically, uh, they suffer from the same problems as uh, multiple inheritance because they mm -hmm. technically are multiple inheritance. Uh, so eventually like, as you use them more and more, you're going to run into naming clashes. Uh, you're going to like, you might have to mix ins, but you can't use them together uh, because like maybe they both use some other mix in, uh, but they want different things from it. Mm. Uh, so they don't really compose well. And so the, um, the higher order component pattern, uh, it solves the, uh, the composition uh, problem. So you don't get like name clashes and methods. But then the problem, uh, so higher order components have a few problems. One of them is just uh, the code becomes very indirect. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the big, like we consider it a uh, kind of like a principle or like a value, I guess, for React is that uh, we prefer direct code. So we don't really, uh, I guess like we don't discourage it, but I think we prefer when it's possible to write code that you can read it and you can understand what's going on uh, without mentally kind of uh, doing these mental gymnastics of like, oh, this thing, it actually gets into like this card function and then it goes, like we want to see the connections between things. And with higher yeah, order components, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add like that um, also is what makes, uh, I, I think what makes higher order components really difficult to type with flow type or TypeScript is that that layer of indirection for sure. Yeah, so that's that's another related problem. But just like even if you just look at, at some prop and they're like, where is this prop coming from? Well, if it's just a regular like React component, you know, or it comes from a parent component, but maybe there's like a bunch of like five high order components in the middle and like each of them passes something to the other one and you don't see it like unless you actually go into them so the whole data flow becomes obscured so that's mm -hmm. one of the problems with high order components uh, they also can have name clashes uh, not in the method names but in prop names so that's uh, that's also an issue and method calls like you need to forward like yeah, there are some weird edge cases but anyway, like render props solve some of those. So with the render props, render props are closest to, they seem to be closest to React. Like they don't suffer from a lot of those problems because they are, they kind of embrace rendering, right? So like React is, has this, like React's components life happens in the render method. That's really uh, the react -y part of it. Like the rest is just, yeah, like, Fire this sometimes, fire this sometimes. But really, the uh, the big picture happens in the render method. And so the re render props pattern is um, by putting more stuff into render, it benefits from this explicit data flow and explicit composition. You can trace every value exactly where it's coming from. And uh, if you want something like a few layers deeper, and then you have like props a few layers above, you can just, just reference it because it, it's in the closure. Um, so I think uh, render props are really helpful in that sense. But if you ever like try to use render props uh, like more widely than like a few components, uh, you're gonna have this just like callback hell. So we call this like rubber hell, uh, where there is a notion of tree structure. So you can see uh, like I have this like locate media query, location watcher, and like fetch or <laughs> something like that and so you have like a pyramid of them but conceptually um, there is no clear hierarchy between them so when we talk about like uh the hierarchy uh, of react components uh we use it because they uh they pass some values to each other because they 
Uh, like they may have some local state, they may want to like show its children, hide its children and stuff like this. But with like with a tree of render props, conceptually, uh, they're just a list. It's just like a list of things you mm-hmm. care about and then you use them in rendering. And so Dominic had this idea uh, about uh, like a custom syntax that would look kind of like async await, but would instead uh, like de-sugar uh, these trees of render props into uh, oh, on the, uh, uh, like a syntax sugar so that you can write them as plain function calls. And uh, I think based on that, uh, Sebastian came up with this idea of hooks, which is, mm. uh, it's not using render props, uh, but conceptually it's like you use things in render by just calling functions, uh, but those can have like state and side effects uh, like encoded in them. And so this allows to express the same patterns as render props, like if, like 90% cases uh, where you don't actually want this nesting, but they are just as expressive. And what's cool about it is uh, hooks are a bit more expressive than just render props. So as an example, like if you use render props, you probably run into this like a lot of times. So maybe you have like a render prop uh, and uh, it gives you some value. And then you're like, oh, actually, I need to use this value in the lifecycle method. Yes, absolutely. So, good, luck, good luck. Like, you, you can't do that. You have to split yeah, the component to... in two. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. So with hooks, you don't have this problem because there is no false hierarchy. The whole thing mm. happens in render. So you just, like, you get that value, it's in render, and then instead of life cycles, you have effects which can reference values in render. So you just, you just it is just naturally there. There is no special API to, like, read context in the life cycle or, like, read some render pop in the life cycle, things can just like refer to each other. I think that's the real, uh, like the real benefit that I saw that kind of sold me on hooks is just that they express all of these patterns uh, in a very straightforward way. Yeah, I love it. I, I think um, like we're always in, in probably coding in general, we're always trying to find better ways to uh, share logic in a way that um, doesn't leave us with code that's hard to maintain. And um, I feel like ren- like every step of the way, we got a little bit closer to that. Um, and uh, it, it's cool to think or to realize that um, uh, hooks kind of came from this idea of that special syntax for adopting. It, it was adopt keyword, right? Like yeah. uh, that was the idea to adopt these um, render props um, and where we can take the, the cool patterns that we have to share this logic and make it even cooler um, by uh, um, just having it be more expressive. So um, what like the with each one of these transitions to these different patterns and, and these ideas or even APIs, um, we've approached like we've solved some problems, but then brought up some new ones. Um, so uh, I, I feel like there are like for for hooks, one of the things I was excited about um, as an instructor was to never have to worry about teaching people anything about this anymore in JavaScript, where you know this needs to be prebound, and so you're using this uh, well, it's standard now syntax um, and uh, and this kind of thing. But like, then when do I use a method, and when do I use a bound method, and like all of that. So uh, now I don't have to teach that, and so I'm pretty ex- pretty happy about that. I, I feel like that was kind of an annoying thing to. Um, for people to come up against. Um, uh, but now um, I feel like, you know, we, we are uh, exchanging some of those challenges for some new ones potentially. So what, what are some of the challenges that you see people facing when they're kind of trying to wrap their heads around this new hooks thing? Um, and is there maybe uh, like room for improvement um, in this area as well? So I think the... Uh... The biggest one that I'm seeing is just um, it's uh, that you like, especially if you already come from like if you already used class React or you used like another library that kind of looks like React, um, you might have an existing mental model of how like how life cycles work, uh, what is the like when is render called, and I think that. If you come with that perspective, when I look at 
code using hooks, uh, you might have two kinds of problems. So one one kind of problem is when you're just like you don't you just don't get what's going on. You're just like confused. Um, but another more subtle problem is when you think that uh, like you just apply your mental model and uh, like from classes and kind of make a one to one mapping to each concept. Like use effect is just life cycle or like this thing is just that thing. Uh, and then when this mental model uh, doesn't quite match because like conceptually it, it is a little bit different. Uh, I think if you don't internalize this difference uh, and like if you don't realize that uh, that like you need uh, you need to think in hooks, you need to kind of uh, like unlearn what you knew before and kind of uh, try to think about it in a different way. Uh, I think that that can be challenging. Uh, however, I I'm not too worried because uh, looking at the uh, at the beginners and people who are like who don't have experience with class React, uh, I find that they catch on to using hooks way faster. So it's mostly the uh, the existing habits that are and like existing mental models that can be hard to break. Uh, but like I, <laughs> another thing that comes up is that like people say, uh, like some people say, oh, this is like not intuitive. Uh, class uh, like life cycles were way more intuitive and like I can see where they come in from and like in some cases I agree that like it might be more obvious how to use a specific like class, class life cycle in a specific situation uh, but also like I've been here for a while like I've I've been on react to tracker since like 2014 and I remember like people getting wildly confused about the class lifecycle methods and like they didn't know where to put uh, where to put the data fetch and like should they do it on like componented mount or componented update uh, component will mount there's like so many methods which one do you pick and, like <laughs> i think it took a few years before it kind of and like rendering also like people would like create dom nodes in render uh, people would be super uh, like annoyed that well, why can't I just uh, like jQuery add class? Why do mm -hmm. I have to like set state in order to toggle a class? This is like ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so I think it took a few years for this paradigm of um, like UI driven by props and state uh, to kind of propagate uh, into into like the mainstream and like be adopted by like other libraries and frameworks. Uh, the top down, the idea of top down data flow and uh, kind of pure uh, or uh, item potent uh, random method, mm -hmm. and I think that's uh, like what I see around hooks is like looks a lot like reaction two thousand fourteen, where like nobody <laughs> really knew how to do. Like I'm still figuring out how to do some tasks because it's it's just a different mental model, and like I, sometimes I look at the code and like wait, I'm not sure how to translate it. And then I need to spend some time. And then I'm like, oh, okay, like this makes sense. And like the next time I see this pattern, I'm like, yeah, like we solved this before. And this mm -hmm. is the exact process I went through in like uh, in 2014 uh, with class life cycles. So I guess like the, uh, the, 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 the takeaway for me here is that if you're not comfortable like figuring things out, then it might be a bit of an early time to adopt hooks because there are no best practices yet. This is a bit of a wild west because we're all experiment. And like at Facebook, we're still figuring out how to solve certain things, and like it'll take some time. Um, but I think the paradigm itself is solid, and it's just that we're still uh, kind of uh, figuring out the consequences of that paradigm. Mm -hmm. I I like what what you've said really well. Like it, I I think it seems to me like more. It's less what's intuitive and more um, we were used to doing things a certain way. And now, you know, somebody moved my cheese. Like now things are different and I'm trying to map what I did before to this new thing. So like I used to just use show and hide with jQuery. Now I have to do the set state thing. And so therefore it is not intuitive. And yeah, um, and like it, life cycles and effects is just. It's like a direct, uh, direct analogy. So you used to do like add class whenever, uh, whenever you want, and now you have to like set state, uh, and like that confused a lot of people back then. But like now, 
is a similar like I used to do fetch in componented mount like whenever I want. And now I have to have an effect with dependencies that is like mm. driven by state. Wait, like why don't I just fire it off on mount? Why don't we have like use on mount or like use on update? So mm. th this is a very similar problem because uh, what React did like in 2014 was it introduced this top-down data flow into rendering. And so with hooks, the same concept gets introduced into effects. Mm. But people are not yet used to thinking of like data flow and how that in influences effects. They're just they're used to like doing one-off operations that yeah. are and so the problem with those is that just like with add class, uh, like your rendering output would often be inconsistent because it just like accumulates over time. If you forget to do it in some cases, your CSS class is going to be wrong and like uh, it is going to look wrong. And so the same problem happens in class life cycles where you might do like fetch in componented mount, but like a lot of people don't know that you're supposed to also do it in componented update, but then you also need to handle race conditions and like make sure that if requests arrive out of order, then like it still works. So there are a lot of gotchas with like how we do it in classes, but many people just don't think about it, and then like they have bugs and then they figure it out. Mm -hmm. And with effects, you kind of have to uh, like they force you to confront that hey, there is top down data flow, and here's like what you want to do, and how does that thing feed into like this thing? And sometimes you have to write a bit more code, and some patterns that are inconsistent. They will just like in React rendering. If you want to render different things on like mountain updates, it's more code than if you always render like the same thing depending on the state. So it takes some adjustment, but the the goal is to make rendering more predictable and to make uh, the side effects from the component more predictable. Yeah. Oh, I I love that. You know, one thing that I. I had to change about my mental model was um, on like click handlers. Uh, typically, that's when I would go do the fetch call, or that's where I'd do you know set it in local storage, whatever the case may be. And I've uh, found that it, with hooks, it actually makes more sense to just call a state updater method and like you know set state for this thing, and have it re-render and have a, a an effect to do that. And I it, that has the really nice side effect, uh, no pun intended, of um, making it um, so I don't forget to um, run that side effect when that state would change in other places. So like yeah. with, in the jQuery days, you'd say, oh, I have to hide it here. But then there's this other case where I'm setting that state somewhere else and I have to hide it here over there. And, and um, with React components, you'd have something in componented mount and that'd be all the logic there. And then you realize, oh, I need to do that also if they click this button. So we're going to put that into another method and we'll just call that in all these different places. But if like in reality, you pretty much always want those things to happen when certain elements of state changes or, or whatever. And so you put it into an effect and it becomes a lot simpler in my mind to do things that way. So I, I feel like the cool thing about hooks is not only does it give us this great way of sharing logic, which is probably the biggest thing that I'm excited about, but it also gives us a new way to think about um, uh, to think about interacting with the React APIs in a way that's a lot more expressive. Yeah, I think it's just, uh, I mean, like, I don't disagree that in some cases it can be more difficult. So like, uh, if you intentionally like want to, want different behavior, like that is not consistent for some reason between like mounts and updates, you have to write a bit more code. And it kind of forces you to, uh, to see like, uh, to really kind of model the data flow, uh, which I think would even be worrying to me. So like, that's something we've tried to avoid in React in general. So we don't really want, um, so like, you know, there are libraries where you have to like learn like 20 different API signatures in order to like do even simple things. Uh, and like, you need to know how to like compose them together, combine them together and like which one of them to use in which situation. Um, and like, that's, I mean, that's that's a trade-off. It's like, you have like this uh, Swiss knife of like different things and like you become a master uh, at them. But this is not something that we generally like want in React. So we, mm. we, we, try, to, we try to avoid this upfront cost of getting something right. And so I think with effects, uh, 
it could be a bit worrying that uh, we are kind of forcing you to write correct code earlier, <laughs> but you struggle doing that. Whereas like you could have just, you know, like wrote something that works half of the time, but at least it, it kind of unlocks and you can like, you can ship the next feature and then eventually you'll fix the bugs. So that could be mm-hmm. a concern. Uh, the reason I'm not too concerned about is custom hooks. So mm-hmm. when I get it right, like if, if use effect was the only primitive available to you and you had to like use it directly everywhere, I think that would not be worth it. Um, but the point is that once you get it right, you can actually put it into a custom hook. And then this custom hook has a simple API. So for you, it could be like use fetch or use like this thing from like your application that like use theme color. And you don't really like go there again unless it breaks. And so the resilience uh, and the uh, like the correctness afforded by like getting it right when you like write this use effect, then it kind of it it becomes this like foundational stone upon which all of your custom hooks are built, and though you and then you know that those work consistently, so it takes some effort to like write them, but then you don't write a new one every day. You just reuse the ones that already exist. So I think that's uh, that's one of the reasons like people are a bit confused right now because we're we're just used to putting stuff into classes. So like similarly, whenever we want to like do some lifecycle, even if we do that in all classes, like if we just copy paste the same code uh, with hooks, uh, I think it's important to note that you know you can extract things and like ex- extract common patterns and use them all across your app, and like it's it's totally expected that your app would have its own set of custom hooks, and then eventually like you wouldn't try to use effect every day; you would just reuse uh, reuse those ones. Yeah. Oh, that and and that's what's one of the things I love about it with with classes. If I had, you know, we we talk about the separation of concerns and and um, you can have multiple concerns in a single component. You know, my concern is update the document title. My concern is subscribe to Firebase. My con- but I'm putting them all in one component, and then I decide, you know, I want to separate these out. And the the story for doing that between uh, classes and hooks is wildly different. Where with classes, I have to inspect six different um, you know methods and and um, and uh, lifecycle hooks, and then put that in some sort of render prop thing. Uh, where with hooks, I just you know literally select all the the text that I want, and I if I'm removing it, I just delete it. If I'm moving it somewhere else, I just copy and, or cut and paste. Um, and I, that, that one element alone is just, uh, so valuable, um, and, and just, um, uh, lends itself to easier maintainability. Um, we're, we're kind of coming down on our time a little bit, Dan, but, um, I wanted to, to ask you a, a question, um, that maybe you can give us some insight into the react team a little bit. Um, so what, what's the deal? Like, do you, do you all just like really hate classes? Was that why you went through all of this effort to just, Man, classes are the worst. Because um, <laughs> classes, like they, they seemed all right. We we mentioned a couple of problems, but uh, uh, I think I've seen a lot of people just say uh, React folks just hate classes. That's why they went through all this trouble. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think we may have overemphasized. Like we we have this like classes are confusing uh, header in the in the docs, and I think we like a lot of people get fixated on that one and maybe we like overemphasize it in our messaging whereas like the previous headers were kind of more important and that's just uh this was the last one that we put in because uh like we wanted to show that we don't only care about like existing users but also about new users and it's like it's a fact if you try to like train new people to react like a lot of them get confused by classes and the thing is uh it's fine. Like it's it's not that we're being like anti-intellectual or like we don't like I don't know. We want people who don't know any JavaScript to be productive in React. That's not really feasible. Mm-hmm. It's just that uh, we speaking speaking of like uh, learning specifically, we see that the struggles with classes have nothing to do with React itself. Like we would rather people struggle with things that are like related to learn and react and to react mental model and to how you like design and write your components 
But the technical issues that people run into with classes have nothing to do with React. It's just like, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it just seems such a, such a waste of time. But then mm-hmm. again, this is not the, this is like not the reason we, mm-hmm. uh, like cooks don't use classes. It's just a, uh, kind of a nice side effect that we no longer have to have to go through this. Uh, but like for people who think that we hate classes, uh, I think it's worth like taking a step back and kind of uh, uh, if if you if you look at the major UI libraries who adopted React classes, I think React was actually maybe the first one major UI library that adopted uh, JavaScript classes and like added support for plain JavaScript classes. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, which is like, I'm not saying that it was like the only one who like was working on it, but I think it's the first one that's a uh, major one that supported them as part of public API. It was before Babel, as far as I remember. I think Facebook at the time used uh, JS Transform, uh, which was like, the, I think even the spec wasn't quite finalized yet, but React jumped on the classes train like as soon as we could because uh, we already had our own like create class uh, implementation and we just wanted to uh, like to use something more standard mm-hmm. that the uh, the tooling would be built around it uh, that the uh, like the ecosystem would converge around it so that that was the motivation um, but we always had this um, so there is this repository which is actually now outdated <laughs> it's called React <laughs> Future but it's not really like Future kind anymore like React and Future in the past in the past <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, yeah, so it's uh, it has some sketches of like possible functional APIs, uh, and like uh, I think the last commit was like three years ago, four years ago on those sketches. So we've always been thinking about uh, the class is not exact. Classes don't model React uh, very accurately, and mm. you might discover that if you like, if you, even if you look at the recommendations. So we say. Okay, you declare a component with a class, or sometimes with a function. Like, how do you choose? Okay, like maybe because like this one has state, but then you're not supposed to use inheritance. But isn't that like what people use classes for? And also, like mm-hmm. you never like if this is a class, why do you never instantiate it? Mm-hmm. Like, aren't you supposed to like new a class? Uh, why do you not pass it around? So classes are like classes give you objects and then you pass them around and you call methods on them. And like uh, a big feature of classes is that you have this uh, uh, dynamic dispatch. So you can say like uh, like something that say hi and then it, it has like different implementations depending on the class. Mm-hmm. That's not how you use React. You don't pass classes around. Like it's a very rare edge case that you would pass this around. But usually you just call this. That's something. Um, so we don't even use dynamic dispatch uh, much, and there are all these weird quirks of how, like this, that props, like you're not supposed to put fields onto a class for a state, uh, like you're supposed to put state into state, and you don't even assign a state field. You like call a separate method. Uh, it doesn't even update the field immediately, mm-hmm. and then something else like sets the properties on your class that are like special. And you're supposed to treat those properties as like as function arguments conceptually, and like some of your methods are supposed to be pure, even though they're class methods. Mm-hmm. So like all of those things kind of point out a mismatch between like the React mental model, which is there are just components, and then the JavaScript reality, which is there are classes and there are functions, and so we were like experimenting with functional APIs, but none of them seemed to actually solve like any like issues that we care about enough. So like it never justified the transition. But with hooks, uh, the combination of like being able to express all these values, uh, uh, like being able to express all these patterns uh, for code sharing that custom hooks enable uh, and the flexibility that uh, they allow with, like you can call multiple hook uh, the same hook multiple times, and it has like isolated states and effect, and like you can pass values between them, and they're all in the same scope. Uh, we think that this maps very closely to uh, to the concept of what a React component is. It's really a stateful function and effectful function, 
which mm-hmm. is something you don't have in JavaScript. But there are languages that can allow it. So there is F and Coca, uh, which let you model this with language features. So we think that this is what a React component is, and hooks are just a closer approximation of that mental model in JavaScript than classes, which is why we like want to use hooks for components. But we're not like against classic per se. In fact, like I sometimes mix classes with hooks. So like I use I write component with hooks, but then I get a ref to a class with some imperative logic, because imperative logic is often more convenient to write in a class. But it's not like I just extract it out of the component because it's not really uh, technically like a part of rendering. Um, so yeah, we we don't hate classes. We just think they don't quite match what a component is. Mm, yeah, I I think that was that makes a lot of sense to me, and hopefully over time, like um, that um, that closer approximation becomes more evident for people as uh, especially new people get into things. I I did recently teach a, a big group of like sixty engineers um, hooks like and and React for the first time. Like I I went through the whole this is what JSX is and everything, and um, it was really. Um, Um, like they were able to pick up on React use state really easily. Where they really struggled most was um, I I had to like walk them through what happens um, across renders uh, because like, okay, so I get the state and I understand that's not been initialized yet, but then how does it call that function again? And then where is it going to get the state? And they really wanted to understand, um, you know, hooks are arrays kind of concepts, you know, um, and, and why do we have these rules? Uh, and then in particular closures um, and, and understanding, um, you know, that the variables that the closure is using are going to exist at the time the closure was created. And, and those kinds of things were a bit of a struggle for them too. Um, but, you know, they, they, I think they got it. Uh, they seemed to, they told me they did. So um, what are some of the like foundational um, elements of JavaScript that people really need to internalize? Uh, so that they can use these new um, APIs effectively? So I think the biggest one is just being comfortable with closures. But like a lot of people see it, oh, like this is super difficult. Like this is, uh, I don't know, like closures full of pitfalls. You have to Google like interview questions about closures, stuff like that. That's not what I mean by closures. Um, So I think in React's context, closures are actually way simpler. And the reason for that is that um, there, there are two reasons. So one reason is uh, when people talk about uh, like closures being confusing, they usually actually talk about mutation. So mm. if you know this classical example of like a for loop uh, with, uh, va- with a variable that is like var i before latin const, uh, and then inside of a for loop, you have set timeout and you log uh, the value of that variable. Um, and so you, like, that's a classical, like, JavaScript gotcha that, like, everybody, like, there's, I don't know, 5,000 uh, Stack Overflow uh, votes uh, question about it, probably. Uh, but, like, that's a classical gotcha that you run this code, mm. you expect to see, like, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, but you actually see, like, 4, 4, 4, 4. Uh, just because uh, it's already been mutated and the closure sees uh, the late, like the last value. Um, and so that confuses a lot of people and that's why people are kind of scared of closures. Um, mm. But what's interesting in React's case is that you don't really mutate things. Like you can, but it's not idiomatic. Um, and so if we, if we remember that props and state themselves are actually immutable, so they, they can't change. They're basically inside of your, of your render function, props and state are as good as constants. Mm-hmm. If you, if you want to change them, you like call set state, that's going to trigger another render. And then in that render, they're going to be new. But like this render, uh, like they're constants. So when you look at props inside of, of like handle something, maybe you have like set timeout or whatever, this props object that you close over it's actually the same exact thing that was passed to you. It's not. It's not going to change under you. Like your cheese is not going to move. And so I think thinking about it this way actually, like closures just make sense because if they don't change, then they're as good as constants. And I think constants are pretty easy to think about. Hmm. Um, 
So like it's just you, you need to kind of internalize uh, internalize this that they're not going to change onto you. Uh, but there's another reason which I think why this is not really a problem. Uh, it's that if you if you don't know that and you use classes, you're gonna run into bugs caused by reading like this that props or this that state in some async callback. Uh, but those have already changed because maybe you moved to a different page. So like if you follow a user and then eventually like you read this that props that user, but maybe you navigate to another page while you're doing that. And so you don't want to follow the wrong user because of it. So mm -hmm. the solution to that is a closure. So even if you use classes, you have to learn closures in order to solve these bugs. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you could like avoid them before. It's just you probably didn't like you might not have thought of it as a like as a bug caused by mutation, because in this case React would mutate this that state and this that props. So you you didn't think of, of, that you're solving it with a closure, but that's what you did. And I think we just kind of given like matching those concepts to their actual names in JavaScript. And I think it can be a bit disorienting if you haven't thought about this way before. Uh, but I think that it makes sense. Yeah, I um, you actually tweeted out like a, a demo, a code sandbox for that specific example, right? Um, yeah, so, so I, I tweeted uh, an example of um, of a, I think I tweeted the example of a class component and asked how you would convert it to mm -hmm. a function. And like, uh, oh no, I, I made an example of function component and tweeted how, how would you convert it to a class. And everybody did like, I out of like uh, I don't know thirty or forty replies, I think only two were correct hmm. because they like they didn't add a bug into the class. But mm -hmm. most exa most class examples were buggy because like people didn't realize that they needed a closure to fix it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, let's see if we can find that um, so we include that. Oh, in I deleted the tweet because oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you got too many replies. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just preparing a blog post. Uh, the blog post is called, uh, it's on my blog. Uh, oh, I'm actually going to plug it here now. So yeah, yeah. it's on my blog, uh, overreacted, overreacted.io. And I think the post is called, how is function components different from classes? And so I, that was just research for like, I wanted to make sure that people actually get confused about, mm. uh, about it. And like they, they were getting confused about it. And then I deleted the tweet because like the two people who actually figured it out started posting answers and I didn't want to spoil it for the blog post. So uh -huh. go ahead and read the blog post. Uh, you might find it interesting. And it's not really about hooks. So like this existed in function component. This is how functions work in JavaScript. It, they always work like this. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Well, uh, Dan, this has been a super enlightening chat. Um, I, I definitely want to talk with you a little bit more about the future of React and, and where React is, is headed. We'll do that in another episode. Um, so before we... Um, um, we end this. Is there anything in particular that you want to mention to our listeners? I don't know. I hope you kind of like React or <laughs> not dislike it too much. I hope you're not forced to use it. If you are, I'm sorry. <laughs> but also, like, um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that it's it's an early time for hooks, and like we're still figuring out how to do things with them. And if you are kind of an early, like, I don't know, if you're the kind of person like like I was in like 2014 who just wanted to play with something, wanted to figure out how, how it works, uh, wanted to figure out the patterns, uh, I think like I would appreciate if you tried hooks and if you like tried to make something interesting with them and like give us feedback, raise an issue, if something's not clear, but how to help you. Uh, but on the other hand, if you prefer like when things are, when there are best practices and like when ev every question has an obvious answer and like when there are tutorials and articles uh, that like completely describe something, uh, it might be waiter, like better to wait out a little bit and wait for those like best practices to actually emerge. Uh, like don't, don't rush into rewriting anything. Just mm -hmm. give it some time to shake out. Uh, unless you want to help, if you want to help, then uh, that would be cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that's really great advice. It's it's fun to try these new things, um, but acknowledge the fact that um, 
when you're using something new, you're going to make all your mistakes at the beginning. And um, so I probably wouldn't um, rewrite your checkout button in uh, as your first <laughs> uh, try with hooks. <laughs> well, so. unless it has a bug goes yeah, by yeah. class, then <laughs> I'm sure. True, true. Just make sure you're writing tests. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's that's it for today or for this episode. Thanks so much, Dan. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to chat with us about hooks. I think this will be helpful to people. So thank you. Thank you. All right. See you later, everybody.